Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Jim Knotts, the president and CEO of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. And it's my pleasure to be the first person to welcome you here today to our Veterans Day observance at the wall on the occasion of our 40th anniversary. And to all of our Vietnam veterans, welcome home to this place our nation has set aside for you. You know, I'm asked fairly often, uh, when is the best time to come to the wall? And my immediate response is always, every day is a good day to be at the wall. So thank you for joining me here on, uh, you know, a less than spectacular weather day, but for this great day to be at the wall. If you look behind you, you saw them as they came in, uh, you'll notice our special color guards as part of our 40th anniversary, we've partnered with the Vietnam Veterans of America organization. Dozens of their chapters around the country have sent color guards. I think it's uh, 32 states and the territory of Puerto Rico. Um, and it's an honor to have them here today to be a part of our event, which is the first time we've done what we call this massing of the colors in this way as part of one of our ceremonies at the wall. We're also very privileged to have the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, and former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel as our special guest today. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. You'll get to hear from them a little bit later. Uh, and we also think this is the first time that we've had the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the VA both speak at one of our events here at the wall. I thank you uh, for coming uh, and braving the elements on this day to help us honor our Vietnam veterans. Before we begin the formal program, I would like to recognize all of the Gold Star family members who are with us today, including Ann Sherman Wolcott. Hi, Ann. She is a Vietnam era Gold Star mother, and her son Rex is remembered on panel 16 West, line 96. A special thanks goes to all of our wall volunteers. There are folks throughout the audience here you see and in the back with uh, yellow jackets or yellow shirts, yellow hats. Those are the park service volunteers who are at this wall helping visitors every single day. I'd also like to thank the uh, VVMF staff for all of their work this week as well. And it's my pleasure to thank our sponsors Alice and Lisa Buckaloo for underwriting the 40th anniversary events. Our platinum sponsor, TriWest Healthcare Alliance, as well as our gold sponsors, USAA and Dr. Robert Wintermeyer, joined by numerous other donors. And it is a certainty that we would not be able to put on these kinds of events without their support and the support of all of those uh, who help us at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. Thank you. 2022 marks the 47th year since the last American casualty in the Vietnam War. Yet for some families, those years did not bring closure as they waited for their family and friends. I call your attention to the empty chair here on our stage as a symbol of the 50 of 1,581 Americans who still remain missing or unaccounted for from the Vietnam War. Yet in remembering them, we must also recognize that we shall not rest until we have the fullest possible accounting of those who remain missing from the Vietnam War. And now I'd like to start our program with the invocation. Rabbi, if you'll join me on stage, please welcome Vietnam veteran and Rabbi Arnie Reznikoff. Uh, Rabbi Reznikoff, he was here, standing right where we are today, uh, 40 years ago, and he provided the benediction at the dedication ceremony. And uh, I've gotten to know him over the last several years. I'm happy to call him a friend. We're extremely thrilled 
to have him back 40 years later to lead us in the invocation. Almighty God, we pray, reflect, meditate in different ways, but today, together, honor our brave, our heroes, the veterans of what must remain a grateful nation. On this date, 1918, 11th day, 11th month, 11th hour of the day, we signed the armistice to end the First World War, the war to end all wars, we prayed. But other wars would follow, many more would serve. So Armistice Day, renamed, reborn, and now Veterans Day, salutes all those who served, who answered duty's call. We pledge to honor those who honored us through their sacrifice and service, but too many times we failed. Too many times we broke faith with those who served, we broke faith with those who died. 40 years ago, we built this wall, this wall of memory, this wall of healing, to remember lives we lost in Vietnam, but more than that, to remember vows we made and debts we owe to all veterans, their families, and those who serve today. We ask forgiveness from those we failed in the past and renew our solemn vow to welcome home, truly welcome home, all those who served with grateful words and caring hearts and every action we can take, every dollar we can spend, knowing far too well our debts can never be repaid in full and some wounds of war will never truly heal. May we remember, as has been said, we're the land of the free only so long as we are the home of the brave and we must forever thank the brave who keep us free. Grant us faith to keep our dreams alive, that thanks to those we honor here today, at this wall of healing and of hope, this safe space that became for us a sacred space, one day we'll beat our swords to plowshares and war will be no more. And may we say, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. And now I'd like to introduce the Armed Forces Color Guard from the Military District of Washington for our presentation of colors. Please stand if you are able. Color Guard, present the colors. As they come forward, today we have the honor of the national anthem being performed by Staff Sergeant Keaton Webb. Please remain standing after the, the anthem for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Vietnam veteran and former VVMF board member Ron Gibbs and remain standing until the, colors, the color guard retires the colors. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Color Guard, retire the colors. EVA Color Guards, you are dismissed. Everyone, please be seated. It is my pleasure to introduce today's Master of Ceremonies. Alan Buckaloo is the Chairman of the Board of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. He's a decorated Vietnam veteran, a member of the somewhat famous Fox Force Recon Unit, and he went on to be very successful in business with a career serving as the CEO of Princess Cruises and retiring as the Chief Operations Officer at Carnival Corporation. Please welcome Alan Buckaloo. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here today with all of you to mark the 40th anniversary of the dedication of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Each year, VVMF holds this ceremony in partnership with the Nat National Park Service. So please welcome Jeff Reinbold, Superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Parks. Good afternoon. On behalf of the National Park Service, it is my pleasure to welcome you here to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. To our visitors, our distinguished guests, families and friends, but especially our veterans and families of our veterans, we're honored by your presence as we mark Veterans Day today and the 40th anniversary of the dedication of the memorial. And I especially want to acknowledge those of you who have come great distances to be here. We in the National Park Service are honored to be entrusted with the care of this memorial for the past 40 years and to host more than 130 million visitors who have come here to pay their respects, to remember, and to share their stories. It is also our honor to care for the Vietnam Women's Memorial, which recognizes the 265,000 women, all volunteers, who served during the war. I'd like to acknowledge and thank our partners in this endeavor, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, especially its president and chief executive officer, Jim Knotts, and Stacy uh, Maddalena of America's National Parks, who provides educational program for the Vietnam Women's Memorial. Those two individuals and the organizations they represent are instrumental partners in not only maintaining these memorials, but bringing their stories to life for this and future generations. Jim mentioned it earlier, but I do want to recognize our volunteers and the National Park Service staff who interpret and maintain this magnificent memorial and help educate more than five and a half million visitors each year who come to this iconic place. We are proud that more than a quarter of our employees and volunteers are veterans of America's armed forces and continue to serve their nation through the National Park Service. They, the experiences they bring to this sacred site and their willingness to share them create unique opportunities for our visitors to connect with this memorial and the men and women it honors. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial is one of more than 400 sites that the National Park Service oversees, nearly a quarter of which, including battlefields, military parks, and monuments, commemorate the military and those who have served their country. But over the past 40 years, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial has emerged as unique among them. 
It is a living, interactive memorial dedicated less than a decade after the war's end, with the conflict still fresh in the American consciousness. It's hard for many today to imagine the National Mall without the war memorials or without the wall when there was just a plaque. The wall is in stark contrast to many previous memorials that were fixated on great commanders and individuals. It does not glorify war, but rather glorifies the names that are on it. It focuses on the common soldier. Author Kirk Savage referred to the wall as the democratization of the public monument, a shift from the great man idea of history to one that encompasses ordinary man. It broke with convention and treated the viewer as a participant, not just a bystander. Quite simply, redefine memorial and public memory. Today, 40 years later, visitors still come to, the, to honor their friends, their relatives, their comrade in arms, and even those they never met. They're still drawn into the memorial, to the names, to their reflection, and the reflection of someone lost and perhaps glimpsed again in a new generation. Today on Veterans Today, we again stand in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial. We pause to remember those who served and those in Lincoln's words who gave the last full measure of devotion. Etched on this wall are the names of the men and women who made the supreme sacrifice and service to their country, but who live on through every visit. We in the National Park Service, with our volunteers, and with our partners, have taken great pride in caring for this memorial, for you, for this generation. And we renew our commitment to do the same for the generations yet to come. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Reinbold. It's now my pleasure to introduce Connie Evans who will speak on behalf of the Vietnam Women's Memorial. Connie Evans is a Native American, having been born and raised on a Nez Perce uh, Indian reservation in Idaho. After joining the Army Nurse Corps, she served with us in Vietnam. After returning home, she served as a nurse in the Army and the US Public Health Service Corps. She is an advisor, a consultant, and educator. Please welcome Connie Evans. Today we are commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Vietnam Wall. Thank you to Mr. Jan Scruggs for his vision and commitment to honor those young men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Also to Diane Carlson Evans for her determination to see that the Vietnam Women Veterans Memorial was built to honor all women who served in Vietnam. The names of over 58,000, including eight women on the wall, will forever remind us of the tragedy of war. Today, there are thousands of veterans, both male and female, who are still suffering. Since the Vietnam War, many have died by suicide caused by PTSD, from Agent Orange-caused diseases, cancer, and from old war injuries. The, memory, the In Memory program honor these veterans who returned and later died from causes related to their service in Vietnam. More than 5,600 veterans' names have been added to the honor roll. I am honored today to represent approximately 11,000 women who served in Vietnam. About 90% of these women were nurses. Thousands of other women served in Japan, Guam, the Philippines, Hawaii, and stateside hospitals. They cared for the wounded who were medevac from Vietnam. There is also another number of civilian women who served in Vietnam. 
We also remember the women back home who endured the loss of their husbands, sons, and sisters. Most of us arrived in Vietnam just out of nursing school with little experience. We were clueless about the many difficulties that we would face. We would soon witness to the realities of war, horrendous wounds and the frequent deaths of men even younger than ourselves. We had to adapt to the conditions of each situation as they occurred. We had little choice but to do our jobs, sometimes without the needed equipment and supplies. Every woman who served has a unique individual story. However, there are threads of commonality that most of us share. We were not prepared to be in war, but often fighting was happening all around us. I know at the 12th evacuation hospital, I served in November 1966 to 1967. We learned fast to distinguish between incoming and outgoing, when to get to the bunker, and if in the hospital, how to protect our patients. These things all happened while we were trying to become accustomed to the heat and dirt of the dry season, the rain and mud of the monsoons. The 12th Evac Hospital provided medical support to the 25th Division which was located at Kuchi. It was surrounded by the hobo woods, the rubber plantations, and to the east, the Iron Triangle. Part of the base was built over the Kuchi tunnels, which was used by the Viet Cong. There were days of mass casualties, the wounded and the dead brought in by helicopters constantly landing one after the other. We prayed that it would stop, but they just kept coming. On these days, we worked for long hours without sleep or rest. The sheer number of dead and wounded we received makes it difficult for us to remember names, but we remember your eyes, your faces, and your injuries. We provided care for your injuries, listened to your stories and wrote letters. Most of all, we remember that you fought for each of us. Those memories of what we witnessed, our successes and failures will forever be embedded in our minds. They will haunt our dreams and temper our every emotion as we live. During that year, we formed long-lasting friendships, and some still exist today. I believe that we nurses were valuable, and we did everything we could to help our patients survive. The contributions of the women who served are endless and will never be forgotten. For those young men whom we couldn't save, let me reassure families that we did everything we could and treated them with respect. I am proud to be the first Native American woman to speak here at the wall. I represent the Nespers tribe of Idaho, one of over 500 indigenous tribes in the United States. Over 40,000 indigenous Americans served in Vietnam. The names of three Nespers tribal members who died are Stephen Ellenwood Jr., Daryl Jackson, and Daniel Tababu Jr. The National Museum of the American Indian is honoring the American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian veterans for their service in all branches of the military in a special ceremony today. I wish to thank the Vietnam Women's Memorial, Eastern National Advisory Group, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund for inviting me to speak on behalf of women veterans. God keep you Thank you, and God be with you till we meet again.
Thank you, Captain Evans. That was special, very special. It's now my pleasure to welcome a special guest who will introduce our keynote speakers, a Vietnam veteran enlisted in the Army, Senator from Nebraska, Chair of our 40th Anniversary Committee, and the 24th Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Chuck Hagel. Alan, thank you very much, and to all of you, happy Veterans Day. To our veterans especially, we are grateful for the contributions you've made to our country, the contributions you are still making and will continue to make. Uh, my role here today is to introduce two individuals uh, who not only are we very honored to have, but uh, in their own ways have contributed a tremendous amount to the good of this country and to make a better world. Uh, I will do that in a minute or two, but uh, I've uh, been given a little reprieve to make a couple of comments, and I will do that. I've, uh, I'm still adjusting to bad habits I picked up in the Senate you just continue to speak. Uh, so if you will bear with me for a couple of minutes, uh, let me address a, a couple of things. Forty years ago, I had the honor of participating in the groundbreaking of this memorial. Uh, another individual who uh, also spoke 40 years ago uh, is here, General Price, wherever he is. Uh, I know he's here somewhere, right here. General Price. Uh, I uh, did not realize at the time, I suspect General Price didn't either, but I never speak for generals, <laughs> that this memorial would have such an impact on our country. When you think about it, there was no World War II memorial. There was no World War I memorial. There was no Korean War memorial until there was a Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Now that's leadership. And we're still building Vietnam veteran memorials across this country. And matter of fact, I'm involved in one in my home state of Nebraska. Jan Scruggs is on the board of that, and I appreciate Jan's leadership once again as he continues to do so much for this country, not just Vietnam veterans and their families, uh, but all veterans and all Americans. I want to thank uh, also some of the original members of the Vietnam Veteran Memorial Board. Uh, three of them that I saw are here today. Terry Gibbs uh, is one of them, Bob uh, Dubeck. Uh, is here today, of course, Jan Scruggs. And it's hard to really appreciate totally the impact that Jan Scruggs has had on not just this memorial, but on all veterans and what's right about this country. And there's an awful lot right about this country. Uh, this is a time in our country, in the world, that uh, is in some trouble. Uh, we are polarized, we are politically divided, but this memorial and our veterans community uh, not just heal themselves and their families, uh, but they serve a bigger purpose in many ways of addressing the divisions of this country. Uh, this country supports its veterans. Veterans have a way of teaching, have a way of serving, have a way of contributing, all selflessly. And I think those are things that often get lost in our world today, that we are more focused on our divisions or what we disagree on. But there's an awful lot we agree on. And, and I think that's as big a part of what this 
memorial today represents as, as any one part of what it represents, and it represents a lot of parts. Uh, I hear, I know my colleagues, Secretary Lawson, Secretary McDonough, and many of you hear from their counterparts all over the world about our veterans, about how we care for our veterans, how we support our veterans, and, and what our veterans mean to each community in this country. So thank you all, uh, not just Vietnam veterans, but in particular today, it's the Vietnam Veteran Day, but it's all, it's all Veterans Day for all veterans all over this country, and I thank you very, very much again for your contribution to this country, but maybe more important, what you represent, who you are, the standard and the model and the example that you set. Thank you. Now, uh, allow me to take on my first task of the day, and that uh, is introducing our two distinguished speakers. Uh, I have known Dennis McDonough, our Secretary of Veterans Affairs, for many years. I worked with him for many years. Uh, he has been a leader in every way uh, in government in this country. Um, a boy who was born and raised in Minnesota with a small family of 11. Uh, that's why he's still so thin. <laughs> but when you look at what Dennis McDonough has done for this country in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, uh, staff director, professional director, there's not an issue that he has not touched in some way. For eight years, he was an indispensable part of the Obama administration. Uh, the last four years of that administration, he was chief of staff to the President of the United States. A graduate uh, of a small college in Minnesota, St. John's. Then he got his master's degree at Georgetown. Uh, he's continued not only to accelerate and improve himself, but he's, he's brought people along. And in today's world, and what veterans need, and what veterans' families need, I can think of no one more equipped uh, in every way to lead the Veterans Administration for all of us and for our country. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the 11th Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDonough. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary Hagel, thank you for the very, very kind introduction. You all know Chuck Hagel by a lot of titles. Senator, Secretary of Defense, Administrator of the uh, Veterans Administration and a highly successful business leader. The title that I think describes him best and which I think he values most, those two titles are Vietnam Veteran and Sergeant. So Secretary Hagel, since that day you and your brother enlisted to serve in Vietnam, you've always answered the call of service. So, sir, welcome home, and thank you. <laughs> Secretary Austin, they had me speak first because nobody wants to speak after Lloyd. Gold Star Mother Ann Sherman Wolcott, veterans and members of our armed forces, veteran service organizations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, Vietnam veterans and your families. It's an honor to be with you today on this Veterans Day to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the dedication of this wall, an enduring 
living monument dedicating to, dedicated to remembering the 58,281 brave men and women who died in Vietnam. Chiseled into the polished black granite and etched into the history of our nation are the names of those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met and gave, in the words of President Lincoln, the last full measure of devotion to our country. For decades, those names have taught us as Secretary Hagel just said, the importance of remembering the stories of valor and sacrifice of the warriors of Vietnam. Stories like the 18-year-old Corporal Rex Sherman, who enlisted in the Army as a 17-year-old high school senior. Corporal Sherman was mortally wounded while trying to deliver captured enemy documents to a waiting helicopter. And as Jim said, just a couple minutes ago. He's memorialized on panel 16W, line 96 of the wall. His mom, as Jim also said, former national president of American Gold Star Mothers, is with us today. Ms. Wolcott, the country acknowledges and honors the weight you bear of the loss of your son, a hero. We will never forget him or his sacrifice. It is an extraordinary act to put on the nation's uniform, leave the safety of your home, deploy to a war zone in a foreign land, and fight for the freedom of someone else. Our Vietnam veterans performed that extraordinary act, again, as Secretary Hagel just said, during a time of great polarization and challenge here at home. So much so that too few of you were afforded an appropriate homecoming. My predecessor at VA, General Shinseki, who knew the price of war after serving two combat tours in Vietnam and sustaining critical injuries for which he earned two Purple Hearts, once said, all who fought in Vietnam came home changed, older than our years, tougher, more serious, no less vital, but somehow less lighthearted, he said. And 10 years ago today, at another ceremony on these hallowed grounds, he described this memorial appropriately, I believe, as a time capsule of the heart, a time capsule of the heart. So for me, the wall is a reminder that these heroes not only answered the call to service, but they also eschewed the cynicism, even when cynicism was justified, and joined their brothers in arms to fight, and their sisters in arms, to fight for our country in Vietnam, and then returned home to continue the fight. Nobody represents that dedication to his brothers and sisters in arms and to this great country better than a man who returned home with memories of his fallen comrades and found a way to memorialize them. That man was Corporal Jan Scruggs, who on a cold January day in Vietnam saw 12 of his comrades killed during the unloading of mortar rounds. He never forgot that day. Never forgot those men. Never forgot their names. So years after his service, Corporal Scruggs dreamed of a way of connecting those who remain forever young to those who will never forget them, to the families and loved ones who were left behind. That dream is this wall, this solemn remembrance. And for 40 years, the wall has taught generations about the power of loss and the power of love. A 
of the power of service, as Chuck Hagel just said, that Jan uniquely represents and that vets uniquely represent. So at this time of far too much division and far too much discord at home, let us rededicate ourselves for at least the next 40 years to the vision of supporting one another, brothers in arms, as, persona as personified by Jan Scruggs, because vets like him, vets like all of you, vets like Chuck Hagel, set the example for the rest of us in this awesome country. In so many ways, you're the keepers of this country's national ethos. That deep and abiding sense of purpose that you learned in serving. Your camaraderie, your sense of teamwork that made you stronger, stronger together in combat, and now stronger together in your communities. Looking around us, as Chuck just said, that is exactly what we need today. Camaraderie, truth, togetherness, true service, true patriotism. Simply put, through your service and your selflessness, you teach us. You remind us what it truly means to be an American. And for that, and for so much else, we are forever in your debt. This wall reminds us of that. This day reminds us, reminds us of that. And we will never, ever forget it. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Dennis, thank you. Now, before I introduce the Secretary of Defense, um, let me also acknowledge, uh, once again, the Director of the Nebraska or National Park Service. Thank you, sir, for what you do and all of your people uh, every day to make this a better place. Thank you. And to Connie, for your comments, uh, please thank Diane Carlson Evans for what she has done and all of you uh, to contribute not only to this monument, but also the addition that uh, has just made it stronger and more complete. Uh, one of the opportunities I've had over the years was to serve as the treasurer uh, of her organization as they were working through what can we place here that would recognize the service of nurses and give an additional beneficial dimension to this monument. So thank you, to, thank you to all. And the Gold Star Mothers, thank you for your leadership. And as Dennis just said, uh, we not only all recognize the sacrifices that uh, the families have made uh, over the years, but we recognize the great service of those we lost, but also of the families. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to now introduce the Secretary of Defense. Lloyd J. Austin III uh, is a friend, someone I've also worked with uh, over the years. Uh, and like Dennis, has made incredible contributions to this country in different ways but all important ways because we all we all do what we can Teddy Roosevelt once said you do the best you can where you are with what you've got and I've always thought that's a applicable turn of a phrase that explains us all and our 
each individual lives about contributions to, to this country. Uh, Lloyd J. Austin III is a graduate of West Point. He picked up a couple of master's degrees uh, along his way to becoming a, a four-star general, served as Army Vice Chief of Staff. Uh, and one of the duties that I performed early on as Secretary of Defense was to swear him in as the new commanding officer, the commander of Central Command, which is about as difficult a position in our armed forces as, as there has been the last 20 years, because that commander had responsibility for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as uh, all of the Middle East. He performed every job that he's ever been called upon to take with incredible decency, honesty, and professionalism. And each office, each command that he had, he left those commands stronger than when he took them over. So it's a great privilege to me to introduce uh, to you someone you all know a lot about, the 28th Secretary of Defense, Secretary General Lloyd J. Austin III. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Hagel, for that uh, very generous introduction. And thank you as well for your brave service to our country in Vietnam and your lifetime of leadership by example as a public servant. And after such a great introduction, I probably should just sit down and it would be. Let me also thank uh, Secretary McDonough for your extraordinary efforts on behalf of Americans veterans, America's veterans. And ladies and gentlemen, we are really, really fortunate to have Secretary McDonough in the position that he is in. He continues to do extraordinary things on behalf of our veterans and our family members. Veterans, service members, families of those who have served and especially our Gold Star families and our POW MIA families. I'm deeply honored to be here with you today. And on behalf of the Department of Defense, let me simply say thank you for all that you have given for the cause of freedom. And today I'd like to talk about the legacy of those who served our country and the legacy that they leave for future generations. And it is fitting that we should gather here to do so. For 40 years, this granite wall has never been just about history. This solemn place has beckoned visitors to feel the profound connection between the past and the present in the simplest of ways by reaching out a hand and touching a name. Standing at the wall, hand outstretched, we feel that the sacrifices of these 58,281 fallen Americans remain with us. They shape who we are today, and they urge us to live up to America's full promise. To every veteran, to every man and woman who has served or still does, because you put on the cloth of our nation, America is safer and stronger. 
That is the lasting legacy of your service. And it demands our lasting gratitude. You know, when I think about what those who serve give to us all, I think about the quiet devotion and compassion of an American med medic who visited this wall when it was first dedicated. He searched anxiously for the name of a GI who he had treated in Vietnam and whose wounds had always haunted him. And so row by row, he slowly realized that the GI's name wasn't on the wall. And the medic cried out, realizing that his patient had survived. I think about Alfred Ranscone, a son of Chihuahua, Mexico. In Vietnam in 1966, Specialist for Ranscone found his platoon under assault. Defying orders, he ran towards the firefight to help. And surrounded by teammates and severely injured himself, he threw his body in front of a comrade to shield him from enemy fire. Incredibly, Specialist Ranscone repeated this act of bravery two more times, covering two other teammates with his own body to absorb the explosions. And so that day, a young man who wasn't born in the United States showed us the very best of America. You know, he recovered from his injuries and he became an American citizen. And amazingly, he volunteered for another tour in Vietnam. And he continued to serve his country and eventually became the director of the Selective Service System. Somehow the request for Specialist Ranscone's Medal of Honor got lost. But the soldiers in his platoon never forgot his courage. And so they kept pushing. And more than three decades later, Specialist Ranscone finally received his Medal of Honor. And when he accepted it, he said, the honor is not really mine. And so he asked the platoon mates who were there with him that day to stand up and to be recognized. I think about Vietnam veterans like Lola Oldsmith, who joined the military after seeing a recruiting ad for Army nurses on TV. And she was soon sent to a hospital in Vietnam, working 12-hour shifts in recovery and surgical intensive care. And she and her fellow nurses cared for both American GIs and Vietnamese prisoners. prisoners. And they would travel into villages and treat anyone who needed it. And one night during the Tet Offensive, when an explosion tore through their building, the young nurse lifted up a pregnant Vietnamese woman by herself and sheltered her under a, under a bed for protection. So Lola Oldsmith had found her calling. After she came home, she stayed on as an army nurse, treating patients all over the country and rising through the ranks as a nurse recruiter. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, Colonel Oldsmith found herself treating the war wounded overseas once again, a quarter century after she went to Vietnam. And years later, reflecting on her military career, Colonel Oldsmith simply said, I'm just very proud to be a part of it. And I think about one more Vietnam veteran 
my uncle. Now, I come from a family with a proud history of military service, and one of my uncles served in Vietnam as a communicator. He was the very first African-American Green Beret that I ever saw. And so he came home wearing that that uh, wearing his jump boots and that green beret, those jump wings. He was very impressive. My uncle was deeply and quietly proud of what he had contributed. And his pride helped to inspire me to serve as well. My uncle showed me how meaningful service could be. And he showed me the way that one act of service can lead to many, many more. So let us never underestimate what service can mean. Never forget the ripples set in motion by the Americans who fought in Vietnam, including veterans who may never have fully realized what a difference they made to those around them because service lifts up others. It enriches your own life, and it makes you part of a proud American story, part of the solemn duty that has moved so many patriots across the generations to leave this country better than you found it. Now, for four decades, this memorial has brought Americans together no matter what they thought about the war in Vietnam. And in that time, another generation of veterans has come home. And I'd like to recognize all of those who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Each of you is also a part of that story of service. And in 2008, one of my fellow Iraq vets came to this sacred place, and he left a pair of his combat boots at, at this wall, size 12. And along with the boots, he left a note on Marine Corps stationery. And he wrote, quote, brothers, these are my lucky boots. They got me through two wars on the ground in Iraq. I figured you would appreciate them more than a garbage man. And his note continued. The truth of the matter is that we owe you an awful lot. If your generation of Marines had not come home to jeers and insults and protests, my generation would not have come home to thanks and handshakes and hugs. And he ended by saying, rest easy, gents. And he signed it as Frank, First Lieutenant, United States Marine Corps. And as Frank said, American troops should always come home to thanks and handshakes and hugs. And as we know, after the Vietnam War, that wasn't always the case. Yet so many veterans worked to build bridges to heal the nation's wounds and to, to ensure that their successors would be treated with dignity and respect. Let me also recognize Jan Scruggs and Bob Dubin for their tireless work to build this memorial and its 40-year legacy, a legacy of healing, a legacy of remembrance, and a legacy of understanding. to all of our veterans. By lending your talents to the United States military, you made us stronger and smarter. By serving with courage and compassion, you set an example for the next generation. And by giving so much, you reminded us that this democracy is worth defending. And you can see the legacy of all those who so nobly served when you speak with the extraordinary men and women in uniform today. 
When I visit our military installations at home and around the world, I'm privileged to see firsthand the best fighting force in human history and how it has been shaped by those who came before. I see young service members' rel relentless drive for excellence passed down to them by mentors who pushed them to be their very best. I see their hunger to learn from the conflicts of the past so that we can win the wars of the future. And I hear their stories of the giants upon whose shoulders they stand, the role models who inspired them to join a proud tradition of professionalism and devotion to democracy. You know, that same professionalism keeps our satellites soaring through space and our submarines plunging under the ocean. It lifted up 124,000 people to safety last year in Afghanistan. And it's behind the extraordinary round-the-clock logistical operation to rush urgently needed security assistance to the brave def defenders of Ukraine. And, and that devotion That devotion gives life to the ironclad commitments that we make to our allies and to our promises to the American people that we will always protect this country and we will always defend this democracy. Now, these aren't just words. These are vows. And we can make them real because of the long, unbroken tradition of sacrifice that joins those who served to those who serve now and those who will step up to serve in the years to come. And for that, we owe our veterans not only our deepest gratitude, but also our unwavering commitment to the democratic values that you have been so proud to defend. Thank you to all of our veterans for answering your country's call. We will never forget what you have given us. May God bless all of those who have served and all who still serve. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Secretary McDonald, uh, Secretary Austin, and as always, Secretary Hagel. We thank you all for your commitment to all the veterans here today and around the country. Now, let me direct your attention to the representatives of several of our nation's leading veteran service organizations. I would ask them please to come forward this time for the wreath laying. For many years, these veteran service organizations have joined our tradition of laying wreaths at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in honor of the fallen. While the wreath layers get into position, I'd like to share just a few highlights of what's been a busy year for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, the founders of the wall. In 2001, we sent out an effort to gather photographs of every name on the wall. In August of this year, we successfully met that milestone. So every name on the wall has a photograph. The photos were mostly were collected by a small army of volunteers from around the country working day and night. They scoured old newspapers, called living relatives, and contacted schools to make sure each man and woman honored on the wall had a corresponding photograph. We recognize those who served and sacrificed had names, and the Wall of Faces now has names as well. While the wreaths are being laid, you will hear bagpiper Chris Jackson play Amazing Grace. Today's ceremony will close with the playing of taps by Staff Sergeant Aaron Ney from the U.S. Army Band. Now, we'll start the wreath laying. We begin with the National Park Service, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, and Vietnam Women's Memorial. The 
the National Park Service, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, Vietnam Women's Memorial Eastern National, American Gold Star Mothers, Gold Star Wives of America, Disabled American Veterans, First Cavalry Division Association, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Fifth Battalion, Seventh Cavalry Association, The Military Order of Purple Heart. Eight o'clock to nine o'clock, PTSD class. Vietnam Veterans of America and Associates. Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 1008. Jewish War Veterans. Quezon Veterans. SDIT Gold Star Children of Vietnam. <laughs> National Dusters, Quads, and Searchlights Association. Americal Division, 28th Infantry Regiment Association, the Black Lions. The U.S. Army OCS Alumni Association. Vietnam Veterans Memorial Volunteers. The American Legion Families. Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States. M Vets. Fox Force, the recon platoon of the 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry. Verizon Corporation Veterans Advisory Board. Bedford County Veterans. And all other organizations that are here with us today. We ask that you stand, if you are able, for the playing of taps. Please remain standing and our special guests and the National Park Service Honor Guard depart. Honor Guard, you are dismissed. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony. Thank you all come for coming. Fantastic crowd today.